Good morning, Westside. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here on this beautiful day, this day where you could have easily chosen to be elsewhere. And thank you for making Westside a significant part of your lives. Your presence is appreciated, and will be even more so in the future. So again, thank you for being here this morning, and thank you for choosing to be here on those Sundays yet to come. Well, the author of our responsive reading today is a very interesting fellow. Kenneth Patton was a Unitarian minister known for his poetic language, which came out of his humanist experience. From what I have read, he was singularly focused on what he believed a minister should do. And that was basically to do two things, think and write, but not much else. He was reportedly fairly poor at pastoral care. He didn't want to do that. Likewise with church administration. Others should be responsible for that, not the minister. He did not use the title reverend because he did not believe he was to be any more revered than anyone else. He did not hold Sunday services in a church, but what he insisted be called a meeting house. And he did not give sermons, but instead gave what he called addresses. Evidently, he got into a lot of fierce arguments with members of his congregation who wanted him to do more than simply think and write. And he argued with his ministerial colleagues a great deal, too. Apparently, just because he liked to argue. <laughs> I kind of like what I have read about Kenneth Patton, while also realizing he was not perfect, and while acknowledging he and I would probably view our roles differently. But I love what his responsive reading says about this house. And as I have said many times before, I will miss this house, and I will greatly miss the people who come to this house as I move to Chicago in just a few weeks. One of the most difficult things that I'll have to do is allow the space needed for West Side to move forward. This means, as most of you know, that I will be unable to have contact with Westsiders after I leave. Some have asked if I'm really going to do that. <laughs> Am I really going to just leave and cut off all communication? And while it may seem hurtful, that is exactly what I'm going to do. <coughs> Not because I necessarily want to, but because I believe that to be the most helpful to this house, to West Side. And it is required that I break off contact by the UU Ministers Association's Code of Ethics. It will be difficult for me to do, but it will be important that I do just that. I'd like to tell you a, a true story that may illustrate this a little bit. There, many years ago, I applied for a job I really wanted. It seemed like all my education and experience lined up perfectly with this job, and I was confident I would be good in the position. I was younger then, as I suppose all of us were. <laughs> But I was also very enthusiastic, and I wanted this job badly. Doesn't really matter where the job was or what the job entailed for the purposes of, purposes of this reflection, but I just want you to know that I believed it to be the perfect job for me. As I went through the extensive interview process, I met with the higher-ups in the organization, 
I met with a committee of people I would work with across the organization should I be offered the job. And I met with a committee of people who represented the folks who would report to me should I be asked to fulfill the role. It was two days of interviews, and it was exhausting, but it did not in any way dampen my desire to be offered this job. My next to last interview was with a woman who, for the purposes of this story, I'll call Rebecca. That is not her real name. Rebecca had a one-on-one -on -one interview with me because, you see, Rebecca was the last one to hold the position I was seeking. She had decided the job had grown too large, and she was going to willingly take it in motion in order to keep working at the organization, but would, in fact, report to the new person who would be hired to fill her old job. Now, I can see where the situation might be difficult to supervise the person who had only weeks before held that same position. But Rebecca seemed very kind. She was willing, she said, to help the new person in any way she could, or she could stay completely out of the way, if that is what the new person desired. Even though she had been in the job just shy of ten years. Well, the job was offered to me, and despite some reservations that Rebecca would be reporting to me, I accepted the offer, and dove into my new work. At first, I merely watched and learned how things ran in this new place. I had no desire to make changes initially. But there came a time when I wanted to implement something new, a new procedure, a new way of doing things. <coughs> I wanted to do something in a different, more efficient, and I believe more creative way. And that's when things began to change me and Rebecca. She did not see the need for the change. She began to challenge me in inappropriate ways in large staff meetings. And she began to rally support for retaining the old way of doing what they had always done. I would walk into an office where Rebecca and another staff member who reported to me were talking, and they would abruptly stop. So in some ways, I began to get a bit paranoid, wondering which of the staff supported me and who had reverted back to supporting their past director, Rebecca. She was taking this change personally. And I began to realize that even though she had promised to stay out of the way and only support me, she really couldn't help but be deeply she was just too heavily invested not to take action. It became very uncomfortable. I was able to get the change implemented, but the group had fractured into two different camps, those who supported Rebecca and those who seemed to support me, those who sought out my guidance and those who went to Rebecca. Those who wanted to do something new and different, and those who wanted to keep things the way they had always been. Every little thing became a struggle to get something done. Well, eventually, Rebecca would seek employment elsewhere, and it was only then that I was able to begin doing the job I was hired to do. But to be honest, the damage the damage was already done. And when another opportunity arose, I left that dream job in order to start fresh at a new place with new people. And that is exactly why when I leave Westside in a few weeks, there can be no contact between us until your new settled minister is here and well established and only then if she or he agrees. Whether I'm 
physically here or not, if I'm still in contact with Westsiders after I leave, it very likely creates a situation just like what happened between me and Rebecca. Now, I am the one who is just too heavily invested. And particularly because I'm departing on good terms, the new minister would have a great deal of difficulty if support was split. If I was in the middle of conversations concerning what was going on here, if people were still reaching out to me in one way or the other. You have, I believe, been part of a congregation where things feel pretty good where there is a sense of excitement, where sometimes there is almost a buzz of electricity in the air. That is very attractive to people. But people also feel it when a church is in trouble, when things are not going well, when there is tension and restlessness. That is not attractive. And that is why when I leave, it is best for me to be totally gone. It will be difficult enough for a new minister to get settled here without me sticking my rather large nose into church <laughs> business. I mean, churches are interesting places, and sometimes, my friends, sometimes we must be mindful of what we say to one another. An elderly woman walked into the local church, and a friendly usher greeted her at the door and help her up the first flight of steps. Where would you like to sit? He asked, politely. The front row, please, she responded. Oh, you really don't want to do that, the usher said. The minister is really boring. <laughs> do you happen to know who I am, the woman in the oh. <laughs> No, said the usher. Well, I'm the minister's mother, <laughs> she repeated, or she replied indignantly. Do you know who I am? asked the usher. No, said the minister's mother. Good, he answered. Then I'll <laughs>
reference a joke about how Unitarians refer to the Ten Commandments as the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> this saddens me a little bit for a couple of reasons. First, because the only thing that comes to Krasny's mind when he thinks about us at all, it is in the form of a joke. And it saddens me that during most of his life, as he went through this religious quest, he explains in intimate detail, a quest where he admits he longed for the comfort of a religious presence. I mean, he calls his book Spiritual Envy. That it did not enter his mind to darken the door of any of our congregations. I believe it is a loss for him, and I think it is a loss for him. For you news. Now I know I'm biased, but I cannot think of a better place to be than in one of our congregations when you are on a search for truth, a quest for that which may bigger, may be bigger than we first believe. I had the privilege of meeting with our youth group this past Friday night, and as many of you know, they are delightful. Are intelligent, and they ask me some really good questions. They all seem to know that I'm about to depart from West Side, and I think there was some genuine curiosity about what might come next. One of the questions I was asked Friday night was whether I would remain a UU after I leave West Side. And I got to tell them how proud I am to be a UU. How greatly I appreciate the community we create around our personal search for truth. How your search may lead in a different place than does mine. But that within our covenantal relationship, we will not only respect one another's search, but we can also be supportive of that search. That we do not merely tolerate one another, but when we are at our best, we celebrate one another, even our differences. I was able to tell them my appreciation for a religious movement that continues to evolve. The Unitarianism of Emerson's day does not resemble the Unitarian Universalism of today. It continues to change. It continues to mature in a way that hopefully continues to meet the needs of many people. But I do not believe many other faith traditions can say that. Most religious traditions set out what you must adhere to in order to be a good member in standing. Unitarian Universalism allows us the freedom and the responsibility to create something meaningful to us as individuals and to us as a community. That is a very different possibility. And while that flexibility is enticing to those who think and believe freely, it is admittedly not always easy to be a UU. What I believe to be our greatest strength, that diversity of thought and lifestyle can also create our biggest challenge. You see, I do not understand when someone does not believe the way I do. It is so obvious to me that my way of thinking is the best and most correct <coughs> way of thinking. And yet we do understand cognitively that diversity is a good thing. We know racial diversity is a positive thing, and we wish we had more of it. We know that to welcome people of all sexual orientations is wonderfully enriching. We know that making room for people with differing abilities elevates us all. So it is too with theological diversity. We know that up here. While it is much easier to sit around and talk and 
be with people who are just like us, who look like I do and love like I do and think like I do, we are called to do something much more difficult. We are called not to just tolerate our differences. I mean, who among us wants to merely be tolerated? We Unitarian Universalists are called to authentically celebrate those differences. And that, my friends, is the beauty and the difficulty of what Unitarian Universalism is today. To not just gather in a club of the like-minded, but to stretch our own possibilities amongst the very real diversity of the world. And I believe that beauty is worth the difficulty. It is worth the discomfort I may feel when confronted with someone who is in some way different from me. In this house, there is a place for people like Kenneth Patton, the argumentative humanist minister who could wax poetic without a need for a God at all. And there is a place here in this house for people like Michael Krasny, people who are unsure whether God exists or not. And there is a place here in this house for people like you and all you bring to this congregation. That's what I believe. That's what I believe we are doing here. That's what I believe Unitarian Universalism 